you are welcome to start the session now. So session chair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome everyone to the, the last day of FSE 2020. This is the first session and we're gonna have, uh, it's gonna be about crypto analysis of uh, hash functions, PRFs and PRGs. And we will have six talks in the session. And the first talk is crypto analysis of curl P and other attacks on the IOTA cryptocurrency by Ethan Hellman, Neha Narola, Garrett Tanzer, James Lovejoy, Michael Kolavita, Madas Virsa, Taj Tirja, and Ethan will present the paper. Go ahead, Ethan. Uh, thanks so much. Um, excited to be uh, presenting at um, FSE. Um, so I'm Ethan Heilman, um, and I'll be uh, talking about our cryptanalysis results. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to present our cryptanalysis of curl P27, um, which is a cryptographic hash function that in TOL 2018 was used to compute signatures in the IOTA cryptocurrency. Um, we extend our attack to break um, IOTA's signature scheme. Um, however, due to the limitations of time, um, I won't be covering the signature uh, attack in full detail. Um, I have slides on it. Uh, so see our paper, ask me questions about it, um, but I'll just give a little bit of a hint of how we perform our signature attack. Um, so IOTA is a cryptocurrency for the Internet of Things. Um, as of 2018, um, when they replaced uh, curl P27, it had a $2.8 billion market cap. Um, earlier, when we started this research, it was the fifth largest it was the fourth or fifth largest cryptocurrency by market size. Um, uh, IOTA uh, has, has partnerships with several large companies. Um, Bosch has said they purchased a significant amount of IOTA tokens and Volkswagen was going to be releasing an IOTA related product in 2019, um, but that doesn't appear to have, to have happened. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, for one thing, IOTA um, uses balanced ternary instead of binary. So this is base three rather than base two. So uh, rather than bits, IOTA uses trits. That is minus one, zero, and one. And instead of eight bit bytes, IOTA uses three trit trites. So when I say trit in this talk, um, I'm referring to uh, base three, minus one, zero, and one. Um, and curl P27, which we'll be looking at, is a ternary hash function. So it operates on trits rather than bits. Additionally, um, IOTA uses Winternet's one-time signatures for its signature scheme. Um, and we haven't seen many practical deployments of Winternet's one-time signatures. So it's interesting to see um, how this gets used in a setting where um, Winternet's one-time signatures or the um, IOTA variant of it um, is used to secure large sums of um, digital currency. So to provide a little bit of background on the signature scheme, um, IOTA builds on Winternet's one-time signatures, um, but Winternet's one-time signatures uh, has the property that um, the signature is uh, proportional to the size of the message. So a larger message results in a larger signature. Um, and this is uh, not necessarily a property that you would uh, want in a practical deployment. So what IOTA does is when, it, when they go to sign a message, they um, take the message and they use curl P27 to hash the message. Um, and then they use Winternets to sign the hash of the message um, rather than the message itself. Um, and so we're actually gonna be using this fact that it signs the message, it signs a hash of the message rather than the message itself to perform our attacks. So consider you have two messages, M1 and M2, and they just happen to hash to the same value. Well, what this means is that since they hashed the same value, a signature for the hash of M1 will also be a signature for the hash of M2. Um, and so what an attacker could do is an attacker could uh, provide a benign um, looking message and a malicious looking message that hashed to the same value if an attacker has broken the collision resistance of curl um, and uh, someone would sign the benign message and then the attacker could use that signature on the malicious message. Um, and uh, this is like, you know, clearly a chosen message attack. Um, and so in our paper, we show how we can um, turn this chosen message attack into a more practical attack by exploiting um, multi-sig 
Um, uh, but you'll have to read the paper for, for, for details on how we do that. Um, so curl P27 is a cryptographic hash function. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, to forge signatures. Um, we are going to break the collision resistance of curl P27. Um, and to do this, we are going to use a ternary differential cryptanalysis. Um, so looking at, uh, looking at how curl P27 works, um, it should look familiar to many people. You have a message, you break it into message blocks. Um, curl P27 is um, uh, built on the sponge construction. Um, so you take the first message block, you add it to the state, um, then you provide, then you perform a transformation function. Then you take the uh, next message block, you add it to the state, and um, you perform the transformation function again. Same with the third message block, um, and so on, um, until you run out of message blocks. Then you perform the transformation function one more time, um, and the first third of the state is your output. Um, so it's. Uh, so security really depends on the transformation function here. If the transformation function was the, uh, the identity function, this would not be secure at all. Um, but when I said that it adds the message block um, to the state, um, what it is actually doing here, and this is different than at least the sponge functions that I've looked at, is that it is not XORing the message block into the state and not um, like, doing an addition, but it actually just overwrites the state. Um, so whatever the first third of the state is just overwritten by the next message block. And this means that if you have two message blocks that differ, um, uh, such as message block uh, 1B and message block 1A, and they result in a different state, if those differences are only in the first third of the state, the next, next message block will just erase those differences. Um, and so we're going to use this property um, and uh, attempt to engineer it so that all the differences are within the first thir third of the state to break the collision resistance of this function. Um, so the transformation function t here uses a round function. Um, so if we uh, if we drill down a little bit deeper, what we see is that it takes the um, the state which is inputted to the transformation function and it runs the round function to generate a new state and it plugs that back into the round function. Um, and it actually just runs the round function um, 27 times. Um, and the round function is always the same. There's no uh, round constants or anything. Um, it's always just the same round function, just repeated uh, 27 times. Um, and that is the, what the transformation function is. And this is actually why it is called curl P27. The 27 refers to the number of times that the round function is is called. Um, we are and running a bit low on time, so please try to conclude in the next minute or so. Next minute. I should have uh, 20 minutes. It's been seven minutes so far. Uh, for, for the live sessions, we only have five minutes. Oh, only five minutes. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I will, I will, I will skip ahead. Um, I did not realize that. So basically, uh, um, very quickly, um, the, the round function is basically just uh, application of an S-box and permutations. Um, and we can see that diffusion um, does not always occur. So you can, um, depending on what the inputs are, prevent diffusion. Um, so uh, if we prevent diffusion for many rounds, um, uh, we can hopefully get a difference in the first third. Um, uh, so our plan is to prevent diffusion for many rounds. Um, uh, won't go into this, uh, but you can see that if you prevent diffusion um, for more than 20 rounds, uh, um, all the differences end up in the first third if you choose the trick correctly. Um, we can compute the probability that um, diffusion uh, won't occur um, within one round using the state machine, which we can turn into this matrix here. Um, and uh, Computing this matrix for k rounds shows you the probability is um, uh, that no diffusion will occur for 20 rounds is 2 to the minus um, 47. Um, if we're a little bit smart about how we do this and we fix some constants, we can get it down to 23-bit collision resistance. Um, 
uh, and so I'll skip over this. Um, I have a demo of it running, but that's probably just um, uh, more time. Um, so we disclose this vulnerability. They no longer use uh, curl P27. Um, and in fact, they have worked with CyberCrypt to develop a new ternary hash function, um, which uh, no, uh, named Trolka, um, which is interesting. Um, they did state- Yeah, please, please try to conclude. Maybe we can answer some things yes. in the question session. Um, So here's, here's the conclusion. Uh, we broke the collision resistance of curl P27. Um, uh, you can read our paper for more details. Um, and uh, we forge signatures on messages where uh, message one pays Eve one iota and message two pays Eve uh, 129 million iota and they have the same signature. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Yeah, if you have any questions, please post them on the Sulip chat. So the on fix if and couldn't go into detail now, feel free to ask. Now, our next talk uh, will be about new semi-free start collision attack framework for reduced RIPMD 160. And it's offered by Fukang. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, it's okay. offered by Fukang Leo, Christoph Dobraunek, Florian Medl, Takanori Sope, Gao Li Wang, and Shen Fukang. And Fukang Leo will present the paper. Oh, thanks for the introduction. So in this talk, I will present our work on the crypto analysis of RefMD160. So as we know, one at all made a breakthrough in MD shard hash family in, 2000, in 2005. And since then, many MD4 like hash functions have been broken. However, if we look at RefMD160, there is little progress. So for the clean attacks on RAPMD160, the best known attacks can only reach up to 34 steps, which were published last year by, our, by us. And if we look at the semi-free start clean attacks starting from the first step, so this is more uh, like to, this is more like, uh, like the real RAPMD. So the best known attack can only reach up to 36 steps and it seems difficult to extend such an attack framework to more steps. So we try to solve this challenge and see whether it is possible to attack more rounds. So from the crypto analysis of RAPMD, we can learn that some progress has been made, but it is still far from the full round attack. I think the main reason is due to the door branch structure. So each, each branch of RAPMD is like MD5 and the two branches are almost independent, which complicates the crypto analysis. So for such a structure, the previous attack adopted a start from the middle method. The technical part is step two. So you can see from this figure, step two, uh, the left figure. So the technical part is how to merge the two branches efficiently, specifically how to make the IV computed backwards in both branches stay the same. However, as I mentioned before, it seems difficult to extend this idea to more steps. So we need some new ideas. For our new idea, uh, we will focus on how to efficiently fulfill the differential conditions on only one branch, and then the conditions on the other branch are left it fully probabilistic. So specifically, if we aim at T-step semi-free start cleans, our attack can be divided into three steps. First, we find a solution for X13 to XT. Then we exhaust all possible values of X12. For each value, we compute backwards until X9 and check the conditions on X9 to X12. If the conditions hold, we further move backwards and then further move forwards on the right branch and check the conditions. So intuitively, uh, as we make a full use of your, the degrees of freedom of X12, the time complexity of our attack should be related to the differential probability of the right branch. However, uh, as there are only two to assert two possible values of X12, after all, the, after all the values are used up, we need to regenerate a new starting point. So 
we may need to regenerate many uh, new starting points. So if it is generated in a bad way, the full, it will also affect the time complexity. So we need to uh, generate a new starting point efficiently. We have two strategies. For strategy one, we can first modify X13 to X15. Then we update the message words M4, X13, M1 to keep the states from X16 to X35 stay the same. As M4 is changed, we need to recompute the states after X, X36 and check the conditions on them. For strategy two, we try to keep M4 stay the same. So we, we don't want to um, make the conditions on, to, we don't want to make the values from X636 to X39 change. So we first modify only X14 and X15. Then and we compute X13 and check the conditions. Finally, we update the message words M13 and M1 to keep the state words from X16 to X39 stay the same. So obviously, if there are only a few conditions after X13, 36, we can use a strategy one. Otherwise, we can use a strategy two. So to further make our attack framework more efficient, the clean generating Differential characteristic should be as sparse as possible in X13 to X17 and in X36 to XT. This can provide us many freedom, free, uh, many degrees of freedom to generate uh, starting points. And the, and the differential characteristic should be also as sparse as possible on the right branch, where, which will dominate the, the time complexity of the whole attack. So this is an example of our clean generating differential characteristic. So based on our methods, we provided the first practical semi-free start test pair for the first 36 and the 37 steps of rep MD160. So you can see, see them from these tables. And the theoretical clean attacks can also reach up to 40 steps. So that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Liu. So the next talk uh, will be a uh, new semi-free start collision at, uh, no, not at all. We just heard this one. <laughs> the improved meet in the middle pre-image attacks and against AES ASHI modes. And it's a paper by Jen Jen Bao, Lin Ding, Jian Guo, Hao Yang Wang, Wen Ying Zhang. And the speaker will be Hao Yang Wang. Okay, thank you for introduction. Uh, this is a strong work with Jen Jen, Lin Chen, and uh, Wen Ying. Uh, block cipher hashing modes as a method to convert block ciphers to compression functions, then to hash functions under some domain extensions. And meet in, meet in the middle pre-image attacks is a very effective attack against the hash functions. It splits the compression functions into two chunks, such that the forward chunk is computed in the forward direction, while the backward chunk is computed in the backward direction. And uh, those bits only affecting one chunk are called neutral bits. And there are some advanced techniques can be used inside this uh, attack framework, such as the splice and the cut technique regards that uh, the last step and the first step are consecutive. And the initial structure is a starting point of the attack. It is uh, a few consecutive steps, including at least two neutral words. And the partial matching is just to find the collision between a part of the states rather than the full state. And the multi-target is just allowed to introduce more targets in an attack. And the previous attacks on ES hashing modes is proposed by Sasaki uh, is under this attack framework. And unlike the previous attacks on other hash functions, in their attack, they fixed the key input because the key schedule of AES is heavy. So if you change any bits in a subkey, it will affect all the other subkey. So it is hard to find the neutral bits for both chunk. So instead, they chose a part of the internal state as a neutral word. And, and we found that in their attack, the freedom degrees of the forward and the backward chunks are not balanced. So if we, if we can improve this balance, then the attack can be improved accordingly. 
And this is exactly what we did in our work. The idea is simple but effective. We introduce neutral bytes from the case states, but only for the forward chunk because the freedom dig rate of the forward chunk is less than the backward chunk. And this picture is an overview of the chunk separation of uh, uh, a seven round AES 128. The blue bytes are forward neutral bytes while the red ones are backward neutral bytes. As we can see on the right column, we only have uh, forward neutral bytes in this uh, subkey state. And we can just introduce freedom degrees from the subkey. But uh, one of the problem we have to worry about in our attack is that the neutral bytes from the subkey could interfere the backward computations. So in this picture, it's a run three and a part of a run two. So in run three, uh, in order to make sure the backward computations following such a pattern, we require that the neutral forward neutral byte from the subkey and the internal state should have a constant impact on the three bytes on, in state 11. And in run two, uh, this is the run we are going to find the partial match. And because of the mixed column is a linear operation, we, can, we are able to move the add run key before the mixed column and so that uh, the add run key operation belongs to the forward chunk and doesn't affect backward uh, computation. And as a result, we just need to find a partial match between the XOR states uh, and also the state eight. Uh, with the help of a neutral bit bytes from the K states, we also uh, able to extend some of attack to H round. The target is to add one more round to the backward, backward chunk of the previous seven run attack. So in order to do this, we have to restrict the impact from the subkeys on the backward computations. This will add more constraint to the key schedule. So, and so finally, we managed to uh, find attacks on AES 256 and 192 because their key schedules have a slower diffusion if you compare to AES uh, 128. So this is the summary of our attack. We present the improved seven run attacks on the hashing mode based on the three variants of AES. And we also uh, present the improved uh, extended attack to the eight run on AES 192 and 256. And lastly, uh, our attack can be directly applied to KSUBC because KSUBC is very similar to AES. So this concludes my talk, thank you. Thank you, Hao, for Young, for the nice talk. The, um, the next talk uh, of the session will be a new, a new techniques for searching differential trails in uh, Ketchak. And that's a work by uh, Guo Zhen Liu, Wei Dong Chu, and Yi Tu. And Yi Tu will give the talk. OK, everyone, can you hear me? OK, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tu Yi, the team member of Crypto Analysis Task Force. And I'm from Nanyang Technological University. It is my pleasure to present our paper, New Techniques for Searching Differential Chairs in KCHEC. Firstly, I will give a brief description of KCHEC and then introduce previous work on differential chair search. After that, I will cover our new three round chair code search strategy. KCHEC permutation uses XOR and not operations in its round function, and the space size is 1600 bits. It can be organized as a 5x5 five five array of 64 bit lanes. Each round consists of five steps, including four linear operations, seed, row, pi, iota, and the only one nonlinear operation, chi. It consists of 24 rounds. As for the previous results, the paper differential propagation analysis from the designers in 2012 claims that three round chairs with propagation weight below 36 are searched completely. And the low bound of six round chairs is 74. Another paper, New Techniques for Chair Search from the designers in 2017, claims that three round chair cost with stretch hold propagation weight 45 are searched exhaustively, and the low bound on propagation weight of four, five, six round chairs are improved accordingly. As for our result, we set the threshold to be 53 for our search strategy. There is no theoretical proof for a satisfactory low bound, but we indeed found many neutral costs. Before I introduce our search strategy, I want to show you some definitions first. 
current parity P of state F is the parity of all currents. If P equals to zero, C has no effect on the state F, and F is caught in CP kernel, denoted as K. Otherwise, it's R CP kernel, denoted as N. We use parity and kernel to represent current parity and current parity kernel. A three voucher coin is denoted by pair F1, F2, or pair bit one, bit two. The three voucher call bit one, bit two with propagation weight, the reverse weight of F1 plus the weight of bit one plus the weight of bit two below the threshold is called the target of three voucher calls. The reverse weight of F1 here refers to the optimal weight of bit zero, which can propagate to F1. According to whether F1 and F2 are in kernel or not, three voucher calls can be classified into four categories, KK, NK, NN, and KN. For the last two cases, the search strategies are quite similar, but for NK and NN chairs, the search starts from uh, out kernel state F1, but for KN chairs, the search starts from out kernel state F2. A group of out kernel state F share the same parity P, so each parity stands for a subspace of F denoted by VP. Under each parity P, there are a group of states called parity bare states that can represent all other states in VP. Other states can be ge generated by just adding orbitals to the parity bare states. Therefore, all kernel states in VP can be covered by just enumerating all the parity bare states. The such space is all the out kernel states of so how to cover the whole such space? Such space, we propose the idea representative of a subspace VF. For each subspace VF of VP, an idea representative state of prime is generated based on state of. In general, the idea representative state doesn't exist, but it only represents the optimal number of active rows of three round chip costs, indicating the low bound of the whole subspace. So if the idea representative of a subspace cannot meet the weight requirement T3, the whole subspace can be safely discarded. There are two key steps called viability check and idea improvement assumption in our search strategy. For NK and N chairs, the idea improvement assumption assumes that F1 can be optimally improved at beta 2 in terms of the number of active rows with least number of orbitals added, added to F1. For KN chairs, the idea improvement assumption assumes that F2 can be optimally compensated with an internal state F1 with the least number of orbitals added to F2. The process of generating the idea representative state of a subspace and deciding whether to delete it or not is called viability check. The outcome of state of that passes the viability check is called viable. Now I will explain the complete process of three round check or search. Firstly, for each prepared candidate parity, we enumerate all corresponding uh, parity pair states. For each parity pair state, we conduct viability check on it and generate all the viable states. For all the viable state of we add one orbital to it and conduct viability check on the newly generated R prime again. So then we repeat the whole process until there is no viable state anymore. After that, we extend all the viable state R forward or backward and correct the target street launcher course. Here's a summary of our results. As can be seen in the table, the threshold in the previous work are said to be 36 and 45 respectively, and we set the threshold to be 53. Okay, thanks for your attention, that's all. Thank you, Yi. Thank you very much. Uh, we move now from the topic of uh, hash functions to PRFs and PRNGs. And the next talk is entitled Cryptanalysis of the genre PRF and generalizations. And it's a joint work between the White Burns and Tim Banner from the University of Leuven and Alexei Udovenko and Giuseppe Vito from the University of Luxembourg. 
And Giuseppe was going to give a talk, but I'm not sure we see him here in the... Thank you. Just... Can you share your screen, please? Sure. It's not working. We don't see it yet. Giuseppe, are you trying to share your screen? Can you please update us? Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, let's see if it works now. It, it seems you are logged twice. Mm. Oh, I cannot see on the on Zoom the screen where there is the. This happened yesterday. I recommend you go on to the next speaker. Have okay, this we'll do that. Out, close your browser completely. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so I hope Shao is ready then. So we'll first go to the next speaker and then we'll come back to this talk. Hopefully we can solve the technical issues in between. So the next talk is a practical seed recovery for the PCG pseudorandom number generator. And it's joint work between Charles Bouillaguer, University of Lille, Claudette Martinez and Julia Sauvage from Sorbonne. Charles, you have the floor. Hi, so I'm, I'm Charles and this is Florette and Julia who actually did all the hard work, but who found excuses not to be there this morning. So you will have to bear with me. So we decided to take a look at the, at the permuted congruential generator, the PCG, which is a, a conventional non-crypto uh, to the random generator. And we did that because we found its website, pcg-random.org, that compares, uh, compares it with several uh, other popular uh, PRNGs such as uh, Chat20. And it claims that a PCG should be hard to predict and that when compared with the others, its prediction difficulty should be challenging. So obviously we accepted the challenge and the result is that we have a, a practical attack that recovers the seed of the, of the generator given a half a kilobyte of output. So it, it's essentially a guess and determine attack that has to guess about 52 bits. And for each guess has to solve an instance of the closest vector problem in low dimension. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's actually feasible given enough uh, time and resources. So, the, the permuted congruential generator is in fact the default uh, random generator in NumPy, which is a, a popular Python package for scientific computing. And it's essentially a fairly weak linear congruential generator, but with some filtering on the output. And the problems this causes, this causes is, are that there, there's a bad interaction between addition and XOR, and there are uh, annoying data dependent rotations. So this is how it works. There's a 128-bit internal state. Each time the generator is clocked, this is updated as in a linear congruential generator. The, the state is multiplied by a fixed constant A, and then an unknown increment C is added to it, modulo 2 to the 128. To extract a 64-bit output, the two halves of the state are XORed together. And this is rotated by an unknown amount taken from the top six most significant bits of the state. And that's it, it's fairly fast in software. And the goal is to reconstruct the first, the, the initial state and the 128 bit increment given enough output. So in one slide, so it's a guess and determine attack. So we target five consecutive, consecutive states we guess some bits, and in particular, we guess the six most significant bits of all of, of these states because the, this allows us to undo these annoying uh, data dependent rotations. We also guess the, the least significant bits of the state, 
and the, the least significant bits of the unknown increment because, uh, because the, mod the modulus is a power of two, which is a bad design decision. It allows us to get the least significant bits of all subsequent states. Xoring that with the output reveals the yellow middle part, which we extract and we forget about the rest. And taking the differences between this, uh, this stuff yields uh, a geometric sequence. We, we move from one of these, uh, of these number to the other by multiplying by the same fixed constant as before. But we only know the most significant bits. So in fact, it's a truncated geometric sequence. And re reconstructing the missing bits uh, can be done using uh, Euclid Euclidean lattices techniques. So this is a Euclidean lattice with its phases. And the point is that the we can build a lattice such that the actual non-truncated uh, geometric sequence is a lattice vector. And the truncated version where some information is lost is another arbitrary vector, but close to the first one. So reconstructing the missing information just means finding uh, a close lattice point to some arbitrary input. And this is exactly the closest vector problem. It's a well-known uh, NP-hard problem from, uh, from lattices. And it's difficult to solve in general, but in dimension four, it's fairly easy. And we just have to, to solve an, this, this problem two to the 52 times, and we are done. There are additional complications that I will not cover, but we can reconstruct everything in the, in the generator. So uh, I claimed earlier that we've done it in practice. So we have, so solving two to the 52 instances of, a, of, a, of the closest vector problem requires is a large computation and it, it required careful programming and uh, a powerful computer. But fortunately we could uh, grab one. And so we, we requested uh, a sample stream output from, the, from PCG's designer. She was kind enough to, uh, to uh, comply with our, with our request. And so we could run the attack. It took, it took 35 minutes using 20,000 CPU cores, okay. And we emailed back the seed to her and she could check that it was correct. So in the end, if you want the details, just go read the full paper. But uh, remember that the, even though it was claimed to be challenging to predict, uh, the PCG family is not cryptographically secure. Well, it never claimed to be, it just claimed to be challenging. And the, uh, the attack can be made practical. And that's it. Thank you, Charles, for a very clear presentation. So we'll now try again with Giuseppe. So we, Giuseppe got logged back in and we hope it works this time. So his talk is entitled Cryptanalysis of Legendre PF, PRF and Generalizations. And so please, Giuseppe, try to share your screen. Is it working now? It's working perfect, yes, go ahead. Okay, good, thank you. Sorry for the, for the inconvenience. Okay. So this is a joint work with War Team and Alexei about the cryptanalysis of the Legend PRF and generalization. So for a given hold prime P, we define the Legend symbol of A modulo P to be equal to one if A is a square modulo P, zero if it is zero minus one otherwise. In a paper by uh, Damgard at Crypto88, he conjectured that the sequence of subsequent Legend symbol modulo P behaves pseudorandomly. More recently, uh, Grasseto constructed a PRF, the Legend PRF, started from such sequences and showed that it can be efficiently computed in the MPC setting. The possible new application of uh, such PRF then attracted a cryptanalytical interest in it. But before seeing the attacks, let's first introduce some notation. So we denote with small l of a, uh, the PRF evaluation in A, which essentially is a normalization to zero one of the Legend symbol of A. With L of K, capital L of K, we then denote the evaluation of the PRF shifted by a secret K key. And with a little abuse of notation, we then denote by LK of A plus square brackets of M, uh, the sequence of evaluations of length M starting at A. The main heuristic assumption we made in our tax is that L uh, of K of M has very few collisions when M is around um, 
the size of uh, log p. The previously best uh, known full recovery attack of such PRF was due to Kovratovich. This is a, a table-based attack, which consists of mainly two steps. In the first step, we fill a table with many L sequences of length M uh, around the size of log P, queried at random starting values AI. While in the second step, we compute many L sequences starting at random uh, values bi, and we look up our table for collisions. Indeed, due to our heuristic assumption, if a collision is found, with how probability we can retrieve the key. This attack sums up to a time complexity of O uh, capital M P uh, log square P over M uh, time with a memory of OM bits. But how can we improve uh, this attack? The Legend symbol uh, has a nice multiplicativity property and will exploit this to reduce the number of queries during the first step of the table-based attack. To see, uh, to give an insight and see how this can be relevant to improve Kovratovich attack, let's consider a sequence starting at A. So we have A, A plus one, A plus two, A plus three, and so on. If we take this whole sequence and, uh, for example, we divide by two, we obtain a new sequence which somehow resembles the original one. In fact, we obtain two smaller uh, subsequences, but th that this time starts on A over two and A plus one over two. Now, uh, due to the multiplicativity property that we have seen before, the times of the same color between the original sequence and the new two sequences match up to a constant a small l of two. Clearly, uh, this observation generalizes to uh, any small values b instead of two, uh, as, as long as um, the original sequence length allows us to do. So this means, this in fact means that from a long sequence of uh, M uh, subsequence uh, bits queried, um, we can extract new subsequences given by a PRF which uses a multiple of our original key. In particular, from M consecutive bits queried, we can, que uh, we can extract M capital M square of M sequences of length M. So this allows us to reduce the time complexity of Kovratovich table-based attack by a factor of M, paying the cost of OM square uh, bits. So what we have seen so far um, uh, is called the linear legend PRF. This is because uh, the small l evaluates in a linear polynomial of the secret key. This naturally uh, generalizes to uh, a degree D uh, polynomial, Monic polynomial F. And uh, we, we showed that we can generalize the multiplicativity tricks seen for the linear case to have uh, a factor P uh, improvement with respect to Kovratovich attack. Most importantly, more importantly, we show that there is a vast uh, uh, family of weak keys, uh, weak keys, which consists of polynomial F, which factor with large degree. So that's reaching a, a better uh, time complexity. Damgard, in his original uh, paper, um, doesn't only propose the, the degree D uh, generalization, but also propose other two variants. In the first one, he, he proposed to use the Jacobi symbol instead of the Legend symbol of N. This because probably, uh, he told that probably this increases the security of the PRF, the total PRF. Unfortunately, we showed that due to this uh, equivalence, we can, uh, the security of the PRF stated over the Legend symbol, uh, the Jacobi symbol is no more secure than the Legend PRF uh, defined over the bigger factor of P. And uh, this essentially translates to attack each uh, Legend PRF on each factor, uh, which allows us to recover K modulo PJ, and then we can use the Senna's reminder theorem to extract to recover the key. Another generalization uses the R power residues instead of the quadratic ones. This is particularly useful because this uh, uh, increases the throughput of the, our PRF. But for large R, we showed that 
there is an attack of, which runs on O, P over M, R. And the main idea is that a single query already narrows down the possible values for K. To conclude, we, uh, we, we improved the previously best known attack on the Legend PRF, which are relevant for the low data setting. The, um, the relevance of our attack was shown uh, by breaking uh, two concrete instances proposed by the Ethereum foundations of 64 and 74 bits, and our implementation can be found online. We give an improved attack on the uh, degree D Legend PRF variant, and for the first time, we evaluated the security of another two variants based on the Jacobi symbol and power residue symbol. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, for a very clear talk. I think Thank we you. now move on to questions. I think one of the first questions that's unanswered um, in the chat is one by um, Stefan. I think Stefan, you had a question to Fukang about. Um, yeah, let's let's attack. let's look at this one first. So I, I was wondering in your attack, so you you use a differential characteristic and then have some clever technique to fulfill the conditions. And I was mostly wondering, like, how do you find or choose this characteristic, and what are like the conditions there to to make your attack efficient? And do you think there's like some improvement by find, finding a better characteristic here? So for how to find the differential characteristic, uh, we use the guess and determine technique. So it is developed by Mendel et al. So the mm. team made many efforts on it. Uh, so maybe I, I, I'm not involved in it. So Christopher is more familiar with it. I just told them, I shared my, my attack framework with them and I said, uh, so you should, this part should be sparse and uh, the remaining parts, you can choose it arbitrary, whatever it is, because our attack framework is very efficient. We can always manipulate the conditions on that complicated part. So. <laughs> okay, so I see, yeah, so, I mean, I'm a bit familiar with that one, so. Uh, so, I, so, I, I, so I think, I think, uh, Differential, the differential characteristic has little influence on our attack complexity. I think it, it, it's mainly dominated by the right branch and the right branch is mm -hmm. used by our by hand, that's all. Okay, so basically you already at the beginning design the conditions so that the differential characteristic has this anyway and you can solve them yeah, in yeah. the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So I already started a discussion with Charles in, in the chat, but maybe we, I can ask a follow-up question because I already got the first answer. So Charles, there is this category of generators which actually claims to be non-cryptographic or at least some of those claim to be uh, hard to predict, and some others don't. Do you think we can actually get a big benefit from having generators which are not so hard to predict? So actually by having weaker properties, we can gain much because it seems that what we have in cryptography now is very fast. So is there still a point in, in looking at these generators uh, by giving up some unpredictability properties? Well, the point is that they, they exist. If you Google a uh, fast pseudo random generator, uh, you won't find the AES first, you will find all the rest. And um, the, the point is that sometimes you, you don't need strong pseudo randomness. If you want to generate uh, random actions in a video game, or if you want to run uh, say a Monte Carlo, a, Monte Car a large scale Monte Carlo simulation, you don't care if it's uh, strongly unpredictable. What you just want is, is that it has good statistical properties. And if it's tricky to predict, you could argue that it may have good statistical properties, but that's, that's the only point I, I can see. I would argue if it's tricky to predict, it must have with statistical properties because if something with bad statistical properties, it's kind of easy to predict, right? But but for instance, if you if you if you're in scientific computing, you want, for instance, your pseudo-random generator generator to be very fast. You want it to be very fast on different platforms, on GPUs, on non-conventional CPUs. Say the, the most powerful computer in the world doesn't have hardware AES instructions. So you can't you, you won't use uh, uh, the AES in counter mode in counter mode sorry efficiently. 
on that platform. So you may want to have some other algorithms. But do you think this is something cryptography should be looking at so we can actually make a contribution and make them even faster? Or do you think this is something we should stay away and this is not really something we should be looking at because it's not our expertise? Well, the scientific computing community rediscovered the counter mode because they realized that it, it allows us to generate pseudo randomness in parallel by just changing the value of the counter. And they designed their own weak block cipher to, uh, to, to do that. Or they, they in fact suggested to use the AES reduced to four rounds. So we could look at it, but it's clearly out of, of, of our area of expertise, I guess. But the other, the other guys are taking inputs from us to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe I, may, maybe yeah. I will go for the first question on uh, on the streets. So maybe Ethan uh, answered on the on the chat, but I don't really understand why why it's uh, efficient when implementing canary in hardware. Actually, so, I mean, why why would it make it efficient? So the argument they make is that um, three is close is like um, better for radex. So you can um, uh, like reduce the size of I think like multiple multipliers or something. There's some there's some argument that like ideally you want your number to be as close to e as possible um, for certain types of circuits. Um, I don't think that I I my understanding of it is that it is a, an idea that people have toyed with all the way back to ternary computers during the Soviet Union. Um, but it's never really uh, panned out and they didn't like do any practical studies when they made this decision. They just, uh, they were like planning to build their own chips at some point. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think the fact that they have now abandoned it suggests that um, when they looked into it more, they realized that um, while in theory, there are some advantages to ternary um, probably yeah. like rewriting all of uh, circuits for the, you know, all the progress that's been done is not really worth it. Okay, so the Troika function, Troika hash function will not be used in Yota cryptocurrency now. Um, so I don't know whether uh, Troika will be used or not. I suspect since they're moving away from um, ternary, uh, probably not. Um, but I don't know, like it, like, I, it seems like a really cool hash function. And it's kind of neat to see what you can do with ternary. So I, I kind of hope that, that someone will use it. it. It looks like a cool project. Um, the, the, the one that was actually like built by cryptographers. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, maybe also I have a, a question for Ethan. So it, it's often hard to convince people about that their crypto is broken. So I was wondering if you, Sometimes it helps like to have like even stronger attacks than whether you looked like at second pre-image or pre-image attacks. Or if you have any intuition on this, that if this is. Yeah, possible. so con convincing them that it was broken was um, uh, uh, extremely difficult. And at first we didn't have attacks as strong as we did. And then we just like kept making them better to try to convince them. Um, but interestingly, their, their final like fallback position was that it like, wasn't entirely an attack because um, they intended to put it in there as a backdoor. Um, and so I think one of the areas that's interesting about this research is that potentially this is um, a case study in someone backdooring a symmetric primitive. Um, I'm not sure that that is actually the case or not, but that is what they have claimed. Um, and the person that wrote it has um, put bug doors in previous like um, cryptocurrency code they've written. Um, and there was another attack on their um, seed generator that I think, just speaking for myself, looks more like a backdoor than this, which looks more just accidental. Um, so I, I, I think there's some interesting things in there um, uh, from just a uh, potentially how someone goes about thinking about backdooring um, symmetric primitives. So you're not recommending to invest in IOTA, I hear it. I mean, I, I, 
it's interesting. Like, I think when we published a bunch of this stuff, like their price went up. So I, I, I think that from a like the stock market standpoint, yeah, like having people talk about it is better than not having people talk about it. So I, I give no investment advice. Um, I think there was also a question by Gaetan on, on right MD160. Maybe Gaetan, you want to ask it orally? Yeah, so, so the, uh, another question is whether 160 steps is, most, is stronger than 80 steps, right? <laughs> I think the designer is here. <laughs> In my opinion, <laughs> So if we, if we see the techniques, advanced techniques, we can find that. So the message modification can only manipulate the differential conditions in the first two, in the first round and a few second rounds, right? So if we target 160 steps, there are more than 100 steps left to be, uh, so more than 100 steps are fully probabilistic. And I, I think there should be no such a uh, suitable differential characteristic. And for the double branch, for the double structure, for the door, door branch structure, it is also difficult to manipulate the differential conditions on both branches sim simultaneously. So we can also find from the orig original paper by Wang on RepMD, the method modification is very difficult to manipulate the differential conditions on the first rounds on both branches on RepMD. I think so. In my opinion, they're almost the, the security is almost the same. But from the perspective of design, obviously the door branch structure is more efficient. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. I think we went to all the questions in the chat. I don't know whether there is any other questions. Anybody in the audience has another question for one of the speakers? Um, maybe I have a, a quick question for, uh, for Yi. The differential uh, trace. Yeah, hello, I'm here. So uh, actually, your work is really going in in depth of the um, of uh, Ketchak uh, permutations, and uh, it seems to you you look really into uh, details. And do you think you can uh, your work can be um, could be really applied on any? Uh, I mean, you can improve all those techniques to over uh, permutation based uh, cryptography. Uh, I mean, over or such as Zudu, for instance, or because you have uh, improved the work previously done by the author, and they also did something on Zudu and over construction, I believe. So, do you think you can also improve uh, what you did to over? Uh... Yes, yes, I have the face. Yeah, I, I think the similar method can be applied to other uh, cryptography primitive. Yeah, I, I bet it can. Uh, actually, uh, we try to do a exhaustive search, but uh, we met some problems to prove uh, this in theory. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess it seems there is no more further questions. I'm looking at yeah. the chat. Looking at anything else? Not for me. So if not, then I think we can conclude this uh, yeah. session. I thank my, my fellow co-chairs and also thank all the speakers in the session and, and uh, all the authors. We have now 